All right, in this podcast, we're going to talk about the um, type of bond that will form and how we know that. All right, so first, let's talk about electronegativity. Um, it's the measure of the tendency of an atom to attract electrons towards itself when it's in a bond. Um, here are some basic values. So basically, you see that it increases going this way on the periodic table and this way on the periodic table and that the noble gases are not over here because they don't have those values. So the ones that have the most pulling potential for an electron are gonna be in this upper corner up in here with fluorine, fluorine, excuse me, uh, being the most electronegative on the table. Um, and that is because it has the most um, effective nuclear charge in its nucleus with those protons and the smallest ring of valence electrons. So that means that they are just, that those protons are really, really pulling and then those valence electrons are super close, which tells us that the smaller the distance and the larger the charge, then the, um, the higher this attractive force is gonna be according to Coulomb's law. All right, so let's have a little um, hypothetical situation. So suppose that we have a free electron and we place it between two atoms. Um, we want to predict what the outcome of placing this electron between these two sets of atoms will be. So we have um, three possibilities and then three possible outcomes. So F and F, so both very electronegative. They're both going to be pulling on that electron, but essentially they're going to um, cancel each other out because they're both pulling on the electron with the same amount of force, right? They're both the same electronegativity. So that would mean that, um, let's see, that would be this one, right? Both electrons track strongly, um, but the electron is going to stay between the two atoms equally. All right, the next possibility we have is Li and oxygen. Oxygen, as you remember, is way over here. Um, it's on the up and uh, right side of the periodic table, very electronegative. Lithium is on this side of the periodic table, so not electronegative. So that means that when we put an electron in between these two, it's going to be pulled more towards the most electronegative element, which is oxygen, because oxygen has that higher um, electronegativity because of that higher effective nuclear charge. So the electrons can be pulled that direction. All right, lithium and potassium are both on the um, left side of the periodic table. They're both metals. So neither one of them are very electronegative, so they're not really going to either one of them pull on that electron very strongly, um, which means that the electron is just going to be kind of free to move about, which is this top possibility. All right, so looking at that and looking at electron distribution, um, on, in this representation, the black dots are going to be representative of the nuclei of two different atoms that are bonded together. And then the circles or ellipses are going to are, represent the area where the bonded valence electrons could be, so where that shared pair could be. Uh, darker shading indicates a higher probability of finding electrons, so a higher electron uh, distribution density in that area. All right, so we're going to try to match um, the, the little explanations with the pictures, right? All right, so sharing of electrons, so complete sharing of electrons, Hopefully you're thinking um, this picture B. So it seems like the electron density surrounds both of them. So it's just kind of sharing of electrons all in general. Um, picture uh, down here, picture C, hopefully you see that one as a complete transfer of electrons. So electrons just completely given over to this one. So this one has a lot more um, electron density around it. And then here you see that the uh, electron density is in the middle of the two. So it's being tightly held. Um, between the two nuclei of the bonded atoms. So um, of the outcomes for free electrons from the previous slides, all right, this one that's being tightly held um, between the two, that's going to have to be your, your F and your F, right? So altogether, it cancels out, um, but, but definitely both of them are fighting for that pair equally, and so it's looking like this. All right, the metals would have to be this one, so L, I, and K, because the electrons are just kind of belonging to everybody. It's just they're kind of just free to float around, right? They're being shared by everyone. And then this one down here would be a definite um, ionic situation, a metal giving its electron to a nonmetal. 
All right, so the difference in electronegativity is not the only thing that chemists will consider when they determine bond type. Um, so they also will look at the average electronegativity of the two atoms, and then they'll also look at the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. So if we look up here, we can kind of get some trends generally laid out. So um, do a little calculations here. Okay, bam, there's us some data. All right, so now we can analyze the data. All right, so looking up here in our ionic realm, oh, snap, Lyric. <laughs> okay, my bad. All right, so looking up there in our ionic realm over here, um, we can see that if we have a medium average here and then a um, high change, that that is an ionic bond. All right, then if we have, um, for the metallic, okay, we have a low change, and then we have a low average. All right, and then lastly, if you're looking at covalent, covalent has a um, low change, but a high average, okay? So, those are the different characteristics that um, we're going to look at. Now, if you graphed all this data, you would end up with what scientists call the bond type triangle. So, even though scientists would like for the divisions between um, metallic bonding, ionic bonding, covalent bonding to all be really clear, they're more like points on a continuum. So, there are intermediates in between. Okay, so... Um, you know, you can see that there are a couple of elements that they are, um, not elements, well, elements and compounds that they have dictated as sort of the extremes for ionic and metallic and covalent bonding. But other than that, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, intermediate area in here where um, elements are going to fall in between. All right, so the term polar covalent refers to bonds where the electrons are not equally shared. So that is where you have one that is more electronegative um, than the other coming in. And we would expect to see um, something like that along, along this region of the triangle because this is where you have an unequal sharing of electrons. Ionic is a completely... Um, transfer of electrons, whereas covalent is a complete share. So polar covalent kind of lies in between the two. Uh, semi-metals are another one. Um, so this is where metallic bonds have electrons um, and they hold them more tightly. They're going to exhibit fewer metallic properties and more covalent properties. And these are kind of your, um, your, your in-between right here. So All right, so basically the final point here is that an examination of the properties um, of a compound is going to be our best way to tell the type of bond. You can't really definitely tell by like what type of element it is. Um, so a thinking question here. So this one's asking us to kind of fill in the blanks um, and to figure out what the classification is of each of these. So if you look um, at the covalents that are listed here, we have a um, one that's a solid, two that are gases, we have a low change in electronegativity between the two elements, and then we have a medium um, to high change there. So if we move on down here, this gas that has a um, pretty high relative electronegativity, or, uh, electronegativity change is going to be probably... Uh, covalent because it follows those other trends. All right. And then um, this one right here, BAS, it's ionic. Ionics are always solid. I can tell you that. That's just always, every day, all day long. All right. And then this gas up here also has a pretty high change. So that is going to also be a covalent for us.